We thank you for this opportunity you gave us to worship you and hear your word. Oh Holy Spirit, you are our guide and our teacher. Guide us and teach us as we open the Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the gospel reading we read today is traditionally called uh, the Sermon of the Mountain. So how about it is uh, Jesus teaching his disciples in the team of discipleship. So the whole chapter, we see the chapter 5 and chapter 6, we see more that Jesus speaking to his disciples what they should do. So in this, generally, this uh, Sermon of the Mountain generally deals with righteousness required of disciples, the way they need to perform their religious duties and everything else, uh, the blessing that they will have or the persecution that they will know uh, as followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, so the, the, the Sermon of the Mount can be seen as something as a manifesto uh, that, to set out uh, the nature of life of the Kingdom of God. So Jesus uh, bringing all these to-dos and not-to-dos, telling them uh, in this Sermon of the Mount. Uh, in, this, in, this, in this series of the, the sermons, Jesus teaches his disciples a very extensive range of issues. Uh, he teaches them about the blessings of being in the Kingdom of God. He teaches them about the blessings uh, that they may receive. <coughs> By his righteousness and also uh, there is a law uh, attached to that law he tells them what they ought to do to, to do a positive influence in the world he teaches them how they should pray uh, and he teaches them also to obey his word and he tells them his relationship with the gospel as a gospel and the law also. And also in this uh, Sermon of the Mountain, Jesus speaks about two different kinds of righteousness. So if we see closely in Jesus' teaching in this Sermon of the Mountain, he sounds more like Moses. He tells them to do certain things. You should do this and you should do that. So he is more assertive and uh, very strong. He issues some warning as well. It's sometimes very hard to see uh, the grace part of uh, Jesus in these sermons. But hidden under all these is the way of salvation. How Jesus is communicating is the grace that he has come to reveal. So Jesus, we see that here that Jesus take, uh, talking and telling them about uh, the that he is the ful fulfillment of the law. He tells them, uh, as we've read, don't think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So sometimes we think, as Jesus' disciples, that uh, we've been saved by grace, but sometimes we don't continue from that. Or we think that uh, the law that Jesus came to, uh, to, to fulfill does not really uh, that that not really belong to us because we've been saved by grace. But Jesus is saying that our righteousness, as he told his disciples, should be different or more than the righteousness of the Pharisees. So also Jesus tells them in this specific part of the Sermon of the Mount that we read, they are the salt of the earth. So we know that salt is used 
indifferent things around the world. But we can certainly say that it's mostly used for flavoring and preserving. Salt is uh, sometimes it's mostly integrated in our daily life. Sometimes we notice a very slight fluctuation of uh, content of salt in our daily meal. Sometimes it's a very small amount we can notice. It's very integrated in our life. Salt is very important. Jesus bringing this metaphor to his disciples shows that his disciples, or us as Christians, are very important in bringing out Jesus' message to this world. We are the salt. We are the flavor of this world. And also he talks about that they are the light of the world. This is a really wonderful thing. Uh, Jesus' disciples, that they are, they knowing that they are the light, what, what does it mean? The world, this is that the, a good confirmation that Jesus is living in them. Because Jesus said, he's the light of the world. So when he's telling them that they are the light of the world, this is the biggest confirmation that he is living in them. That Jesus is living in us. We are his reflection to this world. So the absence of light is darkness. As the absence of uh, life is death. Isaiah 9 2 says that the people who walk in the darkness have seen a great light. Those who, uh, on those who live in the land of the deep darkness, a light has dawned. Jesus has come to this world to shine a light on the darkness, to give light to those who are dead. So when Jesus says his disciples are the light of the world, or we are the light of the world, he is clearly saying that we are the messengers of his light. We are the reflection of his goodness in this mostly in the dark world. So Jesus tells his disciples, let your light shine in front of others, the light of the world. Jesus is with you and let your light, let your light shine in the darkness. Of course, they can, they can choose to hide this wonderful light and cover it, or they can choose to let the light shine in front of others too. But we should always remember that the existence of light <clears throat> is to drive away darkness. But the strongest warning that Jesus has said, and this text comes on verse 20, 20, he says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. We know that <clears throat> We have been saved by, by faith. But how is this righteousness squared uh, with faith here? Because Jesus is clearly showing that there are two kinds of righteousness. There is one that is championed by the Pharisees, and there is one that is uh, given by Jesus. So it will be good to see what this righteousness of is. What, what does it mean? So the source of the righteousness of these Pharisees is customs and also people who live under the shadow of death, he said. They saw light. When the Pharisees <coughs> The source of their righteousness is their traditions. Jesus several times mentioned this in Matthew. They did not follow the word of God, but their traditions. 
They had forgotten God's commandments to follow the instructions they had created. Jesus told, tells them, he calls them hypocrites at some, some point. He told them in Matthew 15, if you read, that you can nullify the word of God for the sake of the earth action. The earth action comes in customs where are hindering them from the righteousness that God brought for free. This kind of righteousness, which is dependent on traditions and customs, is the righteousness that does not lead to the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus is saying. The, the, the Pharisees had their righteousness dependent on their customs and their, and, and their traditions. And Jesus is really trying to break this understanding. That they proclaimed that they were descendants of Abraham, who was righteous man and father of all nations. But the righteousness, their righteousness really was not the righteousness that Abraham had or he received from God. Because if you go back and see, we read that Abraham believed in God and obeyed, obeyed his ways. So we see that it's really quite the opposite of Abraham's righteousness from these Pharisees that they have. At some point, Jesus tells them that they are not Abraham's descendants, but they are descendants of the evil one. So we can see the stark difference between the righteousness that Abraham had, that which was given by God, from these. Pharisees' righteousness. So what is the alternative that Jesus is offering? What kind of righteousness is he talking about? So, if we really look at what Jesus is saying, it's not really different from what Abraham had. He's showing them to look back to what God has done to this father of faith, Abraham. So, it was the way that made Abraham right, right with God. Abraham, Abraham became God's follower through his, righteous, through his righteousness. It is the righteousness that comes from God, not from human understanding. The righteousness that this righteousness that does not come from human strength or from knowledge or from wisdom. It comes from God and it's fulfilled through faith. This is where faith and righteousness intersect. So instead of righteousness from understanding or from strength or from knowledge or from human wisdom, this righteousness comes from God through faith. So that's what is Jesus pointing out when he says, if your righteousness is not better than the righteousness of the Pharisees, so righteousness is really a result of faith. It's not something we do. It's not something that we earn. It's something that comes from faith. Paul tells the uh, Romans, we have been declared righteous or justified by faith. So when the Holy, the Holy Spirit works his saving faith in us through the word and the sacraments, we become righteous. So Jesus is telling them that your righteousness should come from this Holy Spirit, from the world, through faith. Instead of hanging on to the, your customs or to, uh, hanging on to your wisdom, you should give the Holy Spirit and the world and the sacraments so that you, you can gain the righteousness. So you see that human beings cannot by themselves achieve righteousness. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says that surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does not, who does good and never sins, or never sins. And Paul says to the Romans that all, I, 
all have sinned and fall short in the glory of God. So we see that the true righteousness comes from God. As a result of action from God. It's not something that comes from us. It's something that we receive from God. Also, Paul writes and says, For God has done what the law could not do. So, when we read all this Sermon of the Mountain, we think that it is about the law, that Jesus is saying, do this and do that. But what it really saying is, it's letting us know that the law is that, but we can achieve righteousness through Jesus by faith. So by sending his own son, God gave us his righteousness. Therefore, what we see here is that our righteousness, the righteousness that Jesus said should exceed the scribes and the Pharisees, comes from God himself, through Jesus Christ. It's God, God's action reflected in us. It's not something that we do. <clears throat> Paul, when, when he's remembering life before his encounter with Jesus, he says that he counts his efforts, all he has done to do righteousness as a direct. So everything we do for righteousness, if it does not come from Christ, Paul is saying that it's a garbage. It, 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 it really is not necessary. And he confesses that the true righteousness comes from Christ through faith. So we see here that the saving faith and righteousness go hand in hand. That, <coughs> that is true in the case of Abraham. And that is true in the case of his disciples. And that is true in the case of Paul. And this morning, it is that it's true for us as well. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, our righteousness, our light, we being the salt, cannot please God. So that's the main point. Jesus is pointing everything to the faith, the world. So if we believe that or if we know that we are the salt of the earth this morning, that we are the light of this world, and above all, that we have been declared righteous without any of our effort, but through the work of our Savior Jesus Christ, how are we doing as, uh, in, in our role as His disciples? Are we shining our light to this dark, world? Are we being salt and uh, uh, making flavors to this mostly blunt and uh, uninteresting world? And above all, are we declaring and showing that we've been declared righteous through Jesus Christ? May the gracious Lord give us strength and courage to go out and shine our light in this very dark world. In Jesus' name, Amen.